Okay, welcome back. This is again Ryan Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University Libraries in New Brunswick. And I'm just going to, this is part two of the data analytics, our, for data analytics session. And I'm just going to jump right in without introduction because otherwise there's no point in making a part one and part two if we have to recap everything. So we are here in the middle of um, the R for data analysis.r file. And if you, if you are confused by where we are, you need to go back to part one um, and, and look at that. Uh, but we are about to, we've finished our introductory discussion of what our um, functions are generally like. And we're now going to talk about tidyverse packages. And here we need to install packages. If we have not installed things before we have to install them and you would do that via a command like install dot packages in line 36 and I'm going to say install the tidyverse and I'm going to uh, install all the dependencies all of the other packages that might be needed to make the tidyverse work I'd like those too actually you really need those for the tidyverse because the tidyverse is a really what's called a meta collection of several other packages. And if you don't select dependencies equal true, you will actually be missing a lot of the functionality. Now, I illustrated copying and pasting before I illustrated using the run button. And you'll notice when I hover over this run button, the keyboard shortcut for that is control enter. And I think that you might be like me, once you get used to using control enter in our studio, that's going to be the default of how you run commands. So I would just put my cursor on a particular line and do control enter. And then it will run um, that, that command. Now I've already set up my system um, with with the tidyverse on this this machine so it didn't have to pull in a lot of additional stuff this step might take a few minutes for you if you haven't installed tidyverse before so i would say you know pause the video and come back when that's finished um, you should see something like this that it goes through some steps installing that it gives you some confirmation messages that things have been successfully unpacked and doesn't finish with any errors. You know, if it says done and the downloaded packages are available, that's the kind of message you want to see. If you get an error message, what it sometimes means is you have to go back. Often the error message will have the clue of what you need. It'll say missing package XYZ. Couldn't install tidyverse. Then what you need to do is to run a command like install packages XYZ or you know whatever is mentioned there run that first and then go back and try to run the other install again once you've completed the missing piece so often you know there are too many dependencies among the packages to make everything completely smooth um, there's some detective work involved sometimes in adding these other packages in and you can always Google the error message that you receive when something doesn't install and often the, there'll be already be a page that describes what you need to do to fix the problem. This is part of, you know, the do-it-yourself nature of working with a complex network of open source packages. It's not quite the same as having, you know, one single stats program installed. Also, on your own system, it is a good idea to run what's in line 39, the update packages command, to run that pr re pretty regularly to check your system if there are new versions of anything out there that you need to get. Because if you get too far out of sync with the latest versions, that's when it becomes really hard to um, patch your system without doing a, a complete reinstall. If you run update packages on a regular basis, your system will keep running smoothly. So I highly recommend that. Okay, the install 
statement, you only have to do that once on your system. Then you have the software on your computer. It's like installing Microsoft Word on your computer. But when you want to run the software, just like you need to click on Microsoft Word to activate it, in R you need to activate the packages. And in R we do that with the library command. That's on line 42. And I'm, I'm going to use control enter from this point forward. So I ran the command library tidyverse. And you'll notice what it did in this case it's actually loaded a whole set of packages because the tidyverse is an interconnected set of, of, of packages. That's unusual. Usually you're just running one at a time. But here it lets me know that it's loaded eight things. ggplot, tibble, tidyr, readr, and, and these other packages. In the future sessions we're going to return to these in a lot more detail. But this session is uh, to kind of give you a basic example of working through uh, data analysis. So we can um, get help on the tidyverse um, through the R system, but because there is this um, very nice website that we saw, tidyverse.org, I often, in this would be the exception, you know, typically the website is less informative than the uh, package help within R often, but not so much with the tidyverse because with the tidyverse we can get much more detailed uh, browsable help and there are things like these cheat sheets which provide a convenient reference to the sort of standard commands, the most frequently used commands um, and those are also real helpful. Um, they are cheat, true cheat sheets. They're not, they assume you already know how to use the commands and they're just a memory um, aid. So don't be intimidated by all this um, if you see it for the first time that you're expected to understand this. You've already learned ggplot and then you use this as a reference. Um, so, you know, the, the website itself has a lot of great information, not just the cheat sheets, but all of the um, full descriptions of each command are here. And it'll also link you to full books and manuals that have often been written about, about those things. So let me go back to my RStudio. Uh, so what we're going to do in this session is we are going to take, um, we're going to work with some live data. I always like to work with real data rather than a sort of toy file. And it'll be a little bit messy because it is real data, but that's my approach. I kind of prefer you to see that up front um, and think about how you might handle it. And the data manipulation part we're going to skim over because that's going to be covered in more detail in the third session on data wrangling. Uh, we're primarily grabbing this data to illustrate how we'd want to do analysis on it. Uh, so I'm going to run line 52. This actually goes to the World Bank site and pulls a file that's on gender statistics. Um, you know, this is stuff that you you learn about these files by actually going places like the World Bank site, and you look around and you figure out what format the 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 file is presented in, and you figure out where you need to pull the data from. This is not an automatic process, uh, just so you know. But um, I've done that sort of preparatory work for you so that we can pull this data in. We can unzip it because it did come in in a zip file in line 53. And I have to give it a local name, right? So the local name I gave it when I brought it in was called gender zip. And now I've unzipped it. I can actually see it in my files, right? If I go to the files, um, the file folder, uh, 
actually maybe it's it's just in my working space I'll, I'll see some files appear once I have um, done a little bit more manipulation right now it's actually being sort of held in memory temporarily all right so the key here is once I've unzipped it I have the CSV file comma separated values file and you know, that's a very common, very plain, um, very compatible data format. We will talk in the future sessions about how to import from Excel and import from other formats. But right now, this is just CSV. And I want to point out the difference between base R and tidyverse. So commented out in line 56 is the base r command so normally with a csv file you would say read.csv and that reads the csv into r and converts it into r data format the tidyverse functions typically will use an underscore instead of a dot so instead of read.csv we have read underscore csv and the it functions the same way. There are just some tiny differences, which again we'll get into in a later session. So on the right-hand side, now I've, I've used this arrow a little bit earlier, but I didn't quite explain it. This arrow in R is called the assignment operator. And it's written by typing two characters, a less than and a hyphen, um, like that. It is symbolically representing an arrow. So the arrow takes what's on the right-hand side and puts it into the left-hand side. Now the left-hand side is just a name that I'm making up. It can be whatever you like. So I'm calling it gender underscore data. And it reads the contents of the CSV file and converts it into something usable by R. And when I, when I hit and control enter on line 58, you'll notice that it, it did run and it gives us some feedback about how it um, parsed the information. So it's got a little bit of, um, it, as it says, missing column names. So we're going to see what that means in just a moment. So we got some warning, you know, often the warnings are not fatal warnings. They're just like letting you know to look out for something. You'll also notice that on the top right, we now have a gender data object that has 164,000 observations or rows of 66 variables. So that lets us know that, yes, something came into the R workspace. And there's even a browser built in. Uh, when we click on this play, we can, we can get some more information about the data. What are those variable names? What does the data in them look like? And we can even uh, start to, uh, by clicking on the, the sort of spreadsheet looking thing, I can get a view of the data that's in a tabular type format. Now R is not good at really scanning lots of data. You can see not a lot fits on the screen here. It doesn't have terribly sophisticated filtering uh, options, although that is improving with each iteration of RStudio. If you have data that is small enough to be sort of human browsable, you might want to get familiar with it in Excel first before you uh, think that you're going to get a good view of the data in R. R is good for the automated functions um, that we're, we're about to see. Now, a lot of data is so big that it's not possible to effectively human browse it. So um, that's something to keep in mind as well, that you may have to go straight to an R-type environment. All right, so we've, we've imported the data. Uh, an important thing to know about how you can access the data is what's called matrix notation. So if we use square brackets after the name of the data object, uh, first of all, let me just type the name of the data object. If I say gender underscore data and hit enter, what I get is I get a kind of representation of what the data is. It's telling me that it's a tibble, 
which is the tidyverse data format. Again, more to, on that to come in a couple of weeks. Um, it is a matrix that's 164,000 sum by 66. And here are the first 10 rows of data and a few of the variables, the ones that fit on the screen, right? It, it essentially in this view can only show me five of them. And then it just goes on to say, well, there's this much more, 61 more variables that have this um, arrangement. And you can see most of the variable names are the years. And there was something in the final column that kind of didn't come in correctly after 2020. That's X66. And we're going to kind of ignore that because that is not, um, not very significant for our analysis. All right. So that's a big matrix of stuff. If I want to just see pieces of it, I can use matrix notation. And so if I say bracket, one one bracket one comma one that is the first row and the first column of data so i just get the entry in that first cell that says arab world um, by the way this data is for all the countries of the world plus these defined regions like arab world or uh, europe or places like that Okay, now if I want to see a little bit more, I can say the first 10 rows and the first six columns. So I can indicate a range with a colon, just the way the same way we did in the sample command. And here's the first 10 rows. They're all about the Arab world. And the indicators are the variables that are being discussed. So we, don't, we actually can't even really see the full um, indicator name. But there's, there are things about what a woman's uh, ability to do certain things are. Um, a woman can register to vote, I think, like something like this line 7. It's my guess of what that, is, that, that one is. And then if there are data entries, which there are not for the early years here, uh, those, would be, those would appear out on the right. Now we can also um, omit a column by saying minus one, right? So if I say first 10 rows and not column one, that's what is going on in line 63. So you can see it starts now with the second variable, which is country code. And if I want to get all of the um, all of the columns, I can just say comma and then nothing just leave it not even a blank space but just nothing there and go straight to closing out the bracket and now i have the first 10 rows but all of the columns and you know this is useful uh, in various ways when, you, when you're doing your work so um, now i'm going to start manipulating the data and i'm going to move quicker through this without explaining too much because it'll all come back in the third session. So I want to see the names because that just shows me the variable names. And I'm not interested in the country code or the indicator code. For me, the country name and the indicator name are enough. I don't need to repeat that information in a coded form. So I'm going to drop that with the command in line 67. And now I'm going to check the names and just make sure that those are dropped. And we can see they are gone. My, my goal here is to create a very simplified extract of the data. And that's what the sort of next few lines of code take care of. For you to follow along, you have to really do every step here. If You, you can't skip because um, it will uh, be missing some piece that is required later on. Uh, except that line 79 is optional. If I found that if you're on RStudio and you try to manipulate this larger data set, you might crash, you might run out of memory. Uh, so you could experiment on RStudio. I mean, when I say, I mean RStudio Cloud. If you are on RStudio Cloud or a system with limited memory, uh, 
you, you can reduce the size of the data set just by taking, in this example, the first 3,000 rows. But if, if you're not, then you don't have to run this line. Line 79 is optional. And I'm not going to run line 79 because I don't have that memory worry. All right, now I'm going to uh, kind of swap the data around and filter it so that only the year 2017 is available, which I found looking at the data recently was the the most recent years still have a lot of missing data because it takes a while for everything to fill in. So 2017 was pretty complete. So that's why I went for that. I'm going to pivot the data in line 82. And don't worry about what that does because that's coming up in the later session. I'm going to filter the data in lines 91 to 93. And this is using tidyverse style data manipulation. And again, I'm going to postpone the discussion of that until two sessions from now. And just clean up things a bit um, in lines 95 to 99. And in each step, I'm creating kind of a new this is a general data practice that I like to observe is, you know, I imported the data in one form. And every time I transform it, I rename the object to something else so that if I make a mistake or I want to go back, I always have that older one available. And I would really recommend you do that as long as you're not running out of memory on your system. Sometimes with large data sets, it's unavoidable that you're going to have to... Um, transform and overwrite some existing data because you just run out of space. Um, R is, by the way, limited by the amount of memory that's available on your system by default. There are ways around that, which will be discussed in our big data series with using Amarel and R that's coming up. Oh. The standard R installation is limited by the amount of memory RAM memory that your your system runs. So that's when I say run out of memory, I'm talking about run out of RAM. Um, okay, so I have now gotten what I wanted through these transformations, which is a data set called Gender Data 2017 Wide. And that data set focuses on the year 2017 only and I have transformed it so that instead of the years in columns, I have all of the variables are different columns. And so each row is a country and each variable is a column. We can see that a bit more easily if I click on the spreadsheet view. And you can see that I have um, the regions and the questions that were asked on the top right and whether there's answers for individual countries. And so they don't actually compute that like yes or no answers for the regions, but they do get into that for individual countries. Um, and of course, there's 627 variables here, so I'm, I'm not going to try to browse any further. Uh, but you can see, kind of get a feel here of what I've done with the data. Okay. Uh, also, in line one, lines 101, 102, just notice that if you've read data into R, you can equally well write data out of R. So we, once we're, when we're working in R, we're in the R native formats. You know, to make things usable to others, often we need to get it out. And so we can write CSV files, we can write Excel files. That's also coming back in a couple of uh, sessions. All right. Now I can get information about my data set via a command like summary, and I'll let you run the 109 and 110. Um, I'm just going to go straight to 111, which is the summary for the final version of the data set. And basically what that does is give us, gives us information about every question, um, except that it doesn't really display that well on this screen. It, um, I can see that a bit more. I'll, I'll see that again um, in a couple of lines. 
So for right now, let's let's just move past lines 109 to 111. If we want to improve the um, way that it is summarized, there is a way in tidyverse to do that, which is illustrated in lines 114 and 115. So we're going to take the gender data wide and pass it using this symbol that's called a pipe. And we're seeing that for the first time, or mentioning it for the first time right now. That's going to be a key to the data wrangling that we see in, in lesson three, session three. And so I take the existing gender data and then I summarize it. And then when I summarize it this way, I can specify what I'd like to see. So here I'd like to see the mean, and it will report only the mean for each of those variables. Except, once again, I've got this summary view. And to push the entire output into a table is something that um, I'd really want to do as a separate step. OK, I'm going to also give you a caution. Right, We've seen the ls function in action. The ls function now will have a few more things associated with it because we've processed these gender data files. Uh, if you want to remove things from your workspace, and I'll, I'll go ahead and remove the funky add because we don't really need that. I can just say rm and then the name of the object. And now it's gone from our list in the environment. It's gone if we tr if we try to list the function. Also, if you're not aware, a, a very useful shortcut is to use the up arrow, which cycles through the recent commands. So if you want to run something again and it's this long thing that you don't you don't want to type, you just use the up arrow and it'll retrieve the most recent commands for you in order like that. So that's, that's what I did just now to get the ls command back. But on line 119, this is my warning to you, is don't run line 119 unless you're sure you want to remove everything. If you want to remove everything from your workspace, you can list everything in your workspace with ls and then pass that list to the remove function and the shorthand for that is like this in line 119. But don't run that. <laughs> don't run that now. It's a very dangerous command. You always want to sort of think twice uh, before before running any remove command, any RM command. Uh, think twice. Make sure you you really want to do that. Okay. So now we've we've got all our data ready to go. Now we really want to start studying uh, studying it. And in this example, we're going to study a particular thing, which is life expectancy. So I'm going to look at the mean life expectancy at birth for women. And that is in line 123. So if I run that command in line 123, I can see that across all countries, that's, this is a simple average. It's not weighted by population. Uh, the mean is 74.7. And how does that command work? Well, mean is obvious what that does. Inside the parentheses, we have this fairly long um, thing, which says, first it says gender data 2017 wide. That's the name of the data set that we want to pull the variable from. And then there's a dollar sign. I call this the dollar sign notation. Um, after the dollar sign comes the name of the variable. So in this example, because we took the data straight from a live source, the variable names are quite long and they're not computer friendly because they have spaces in them and stuff. So we can deal with that by enclosing the variable name in a, not quite a, a quotation, but these sort of backward um, apostrophes, backtick marks, um, and that enables the computer to recognize that it, we want to look for that entire string. 
Um, when you're creating your own data, I really would recommend simplifying the data names and using um, something like life underscore expectancy is a much more computer friendly name that you won't have to escape in quotes. Um, or it could be life expect female life expectancy is more straightforward. But since this simply read the column names in from the external data file, this is what we've got. And we do have to uh, remove not available data in order to get an accurate uh, count. Otherwise, we'll get an error. So we have to say na.rm equals true. That's the option to remove the not available data. If I remove, if I don't say narm equals true, um, and I'm going to do that again, it's going one. There we go. My answer is then going to be na because it just can't deal with the missing data. So we have to remove the missing data before we take the mean. Um, now I can take a summary of this same variable. That's in line 124. This is when I said earlier, let's wait a little bit on what the summary does. We were trying to display too much data before, but the summary for one variable shows us this encapsulated description, uh, descriptive statistics. So life expectancy, the minimum life expectancy for women is 54 across all countries in 2017. Median of 76, mean almost 75. And there are 18 missing data elements there. Whether those are countries or regions, we're not sure. Also the max, uh, 87.6. It also shows us the quartiles, right? So we get this sense of what that particular data item is about. So the summary command is, it's always useful like that. It gives you this useful information. All right, so I, I talked about this dollar sign notation where we, you know, in general, we're, we refer to a data set, we might say gender um, life expectancy, gender dollar sign life expectancy would be a simpler example uh, for a different data set where we, we name the data set and after the dollar sign is the name of the variable. R can handle multiple data sets at once. This is a strength of R. It enables us to you know, mix and match things and we don't have to um, merge data sets in particular in order for them to work together. So that's good. But sometimes it's a pain because we're only dealing with one data set and we don't want to go around typing the name of the data set dollar sign over and over again. We can get around that by attaching data. So this is line 127. We're going to attach the entire data set, gender data 2017 wide. And now we can simply ask for the mean of the life expectancy without the additional dollar name of the data set dollar sign prefix. So we can get the female life expectancy, we can get the male life expectancy, which is notably lower, it's just under 70, and we can get summaries of those two. So the um, third quartile of male life expectancy is very similar, or is even below the median life expectancy for females. So we, we want to kind of understand this relationship um, in this example. We can visualize the data. Now, next session on ggplot, we'll do all visualization, lots and lots of visualizations. But right now, we're just doing a basic plot. And we plot one variable against another. So we say plot the name of the variable, which in, in this example is the long full description. And we use this tilde, or little squiggly symbol, to say plot what's on the left-hand side versus what's on the right-hand side. The, the tilde, if you're not familiar with typing that, lives up in the top left of your keyboard 
uh, you should be able to find it up there with the shift. Um, and that tilde gets used a lot in R. We're, we're about to see it come back again. All right, so this looks like um, what we're plotting here is on a country by country basis, right? It looks like there's a, a pretty linear relationship. If there's low life expectancy for males in the country, there's low life expectancy for females. Okay, this looks maybe like what we would expect. Uh, but we can also plot a simply a 45 degree line on top of this graph, um, which is not going to quite look like 45 degrees because this graph sort of stretches to fit the space. If we um, stretch the window, we get something like that. Once we plot the 45 degree line on top, we notice that actually in every case, every country, the male life expectancy is lower than female life expectancy. All of the female dots lie above the line, which is what that means. Uh, this is another nice feature of our studio, by the way, is that when you plot something, it just pops up in your viewing area on the right. It doesn't interfere with your code on the left. Okay, so we'd like to study this question a little bit more. I'd like to compute the difference in life expectancy country by country. So that's pretty straightforward in R. I'm going to name the new variable in line 138. And I'm going to say this new variable is using the assignment operator once again, the kind of arrow once again generated by typing a less than sign and a hyphen. And it's going to be defined by life expectancy for females minus life expectancy for males. And, you know, this is the minus sign that does all the work. Uh, again, I'm still enclosing those long variable names with spaces in tick marks so that um, I don't generate any errors. And, you know, R operates sort of natively on vectors, on matrices. This is one of the really nice features about it. So even though I have this very simple uh, form of the equation, which is essentially this life spread is female minus male. Um, because each of those is a, is a vector, it's going to automatically go element by element. And the results will be a list of, you know, the difference for each country. And once I have that information, I can do like I did before, see the mean, see the summary. So the minimum difference in life expectancy is 0.6, and the maximum goes all the way up to where women live 12 years longer than men. It's really quite a, uh, a range. When we plot this new variable, um, the basic plot is just plotting the index that we see in line 141 is just each country, right? So the, the index is, it's probably alphabetical by country. And so it doesn't have a, you know, a mean, a data meaning in a sense, which is why we see the plot um, scattered looking like that. However, we can plot against other things like in line 142, we plot against GDP or GDP per capita in constant $2010. So here we can see, okay, there is some pattern that for higher per capita income, the life expectancy differences are maybe not quite as extreme or as variable as they are for low. Um, however, the places with the lowest difference are also low income is interesting. And I'm going to skim through 144 to 150 very quickly because uh, R has a whole bunch of functions for descriptive statistics. They're very straightforward. SD for standard deviation, VAR for variance, median, quantile, etc. And just to, again, reiterate that if you don't remove the not available data, most of these functions are going to just break down. So if I say SD life spread, hoping to get the standard deviation, I get an error. But if I remove the not available 
um, entries, then I'll get a meaningful result in line 146. So I'm just running those. Here's the variance. Here's the median. Here are the, the quantiles expressed just by themselves. Um, also, you can customize the quantiles, right? If you need to see the 0.1%, the 1%, the 10%, there is a way to ask for that. And again, recalling part one, um, we could find out exactly how to do that by typing question mark quantile. And it's going to show us, okay, we can actually provide a sequence of probabilities for the exact cut points that we're interested in in, in finding out. Uh, and finally, here's a summary of the life spread, which we've already uh, seen that. We can also do a histogram. So I think you know we're, we're teasing you with a little bit of graphics before next session. Uh, so the histogram, again, a very simple command, hist. All right, so what other things might we want to do to study our data? We can, we can create a table um, in 157. This simply counts the number of observations, and in this case kind of just verifies that we have only one year of data. We've got one entry for each country, and they, they seem to be correct and complete. That's, that's more of a verification step. All right, so in order to um, sort of simplify the way we look at this data, I'm going to create categorical variables. This is in line 160 and line 161. In line 160, I'm going to apply a conditional test. And the conditional test actually generates the new set of variables. So for those countries that have a greater than 5 gap, which is approximately the, um, let me run this one again, right, our summary showed that the, the mean difference was 4.799. So 5 is close enough for this rough exercise to say if the country has female life expectancy more than 5 years more than men, we're going to call that a high spread. And if it's less than that, it'll, by definition, be a low spread. So when I run that, the resulting variable generated by the assignment operator, and I had a typo there, is a true or false, right? So is it true that the life expectancy gap is more than five or false? or missing, right? And this is a logical variable in R, but we can work with logical variables very easily in R, as we're going to see. Uh, we're also going to create one for a high age. So the uh, approximate mean of female life expectancy is 78. So if women live more than 78 years, that's a high life expectancy. Otherwise, we're going to classify them as low. And this is a little subtlety, which is can be important. When we when we attach the data, I, I skimmed over that briefly, and I kind of said that's a way to not have to use the dollar sign notation to make a certain data set a default data set. What R actually does is make a copy of the data and kind of foregrounds it in the space. So if we make changes to the data, we have to attach it again so that the fresh copy includes the changes. So that's a may seem like a little bit of a subtle caveat first time through, but you'll you'll find out when when you've tried to create a variable and it doesn't exist in your attached data set, I hope you'll remember that warning and you'll be able to come back and reattach your data. All right, so I have attached the data again. It gives me a warning that I'm actually overwriting all the other variables that were there with the new data. That's why we have this long um, statement to say the following objects are masked because we have so many variables. And now we can create a table. Right? There are um, 93 high spread life expectancy 
countries, 152 non. Uh, the high age difference is also similar kind of split. Um, and when we do a cross tab, we just do a table of the two variables together in line 169. And that cross tab is, um, shows us that 108, a big amount, fall into both the low age and the low spread category. 53 fall into the true true category where they're both high life spread and high age. If these things were completely you know, related to each other, we wouldn't see anything on the diagonal axes, right, where they have a high age but a low spread or, or vice versa. And this is the kind of thing that we can do a test to test the difference. We can do um, chi-square tests, we can do t-tests, and these types of tests, I'm not going to illustrate a chi-square test, but um, we're going to illustrate a t-test that this is where R gets easy because R is designed for statistics and so once you know the name of the command you just go straight to that and so we can say t-test life spread that's line 173 uh, what is the t-test test for well it's testing whether a particular number is different than a test value right our null hypothesis now by default we're testing that the life spread is not equal to zero. Always the default null hypothesis will be zero. And we saw that even the minimum, there was no country in the world where men had a higher life expectancy than women. So we would expect this result with a minuscule p-value, super significant. We can definitely say it's not random. Women have a higher life expectancy than women than men. Um, now we could test other hypotheses by adjusting the mu, right? So if we say, is it true that women have a greater than five uh, additional year life expectancy than men, we can adjust that. The mu is the notation here because mu is the Greek that's used for mean in the t-test. Uh, this is an example of R being like a little inconsistent, like each function is a little bit different. So instead of saying mean equals five, for this test we say mu. And again, sometimes you have to use that question mark to make sure, okay, I remember how the t-test works. Um, how do I specify the mean? Well, this will remind you that it's mu. And it will also show you the other methodological variations that you can you can use. Um, there's always these sort of technicalities involved in the statistical uh, tests and if you need to adjust something specific like here the um, equal variance assumption can be important. Um, those technicalities are there and you can adjust for them in R. Just look at the help. Uh, here we're just changing the mean to 5 and on line 174, we run the test again, and we do not have a significant p-value, at least if we're using the traditional 0.05. We can also see the confidence interval, that the 95% confidence interval is includes 5, which is a little you know, unusual, but um, in this case, the p-value is, uh, is still not significant. We can also change things like you know the the confidence level. Um, we can say with the 99% confidence level that the true mean is not four. It's definitely different than four, whereas we can't quite say it with the same certainty about five. We also have this variation of the t-test where we can take a two-sample t-test. We can compare two groups. So we have a categorical variable, which is high age and also life spread. It would be, not be interesting to test life spread against itself, uh, but we can test whether life spread is significantly different between the two age groups, the high life expectancy women and the low exp life expectancy women. And that's in line 179. Oh, 
and I didn't run the entire line, so I just got this weird result. Um, so here's our two sample t test. P value is highly significant. Um, the true difference in means is not equal to zero. And here that's an appropriate assumption because we just want to see if those two groups are different. And difference in this case means having a mean that's not, that we can with some statistical certainty say is not equal to zero. And so we find that um, the low life expectancy women, that's the false group, are have a difference of 4. Point, I'm going to round it to 4.4. .4. The high life expectancy group has a difference of 5.4. So, you know, it looks like a big gap. There's an additional year there in extra female life expectancy. But we can verify it via the t-test. Um, you can consult the help for chi-square test. That's easy to run, um, very easy to look at. And so our last topic that we're going to touch on here is the statistical is linear regression. And so we'll be done in about another five minutes here. Um, linear regression is just LM. Now, like everything else in R, if you need other forms of regression, GLM, logistic, you know, it's all there. There are different, slightly different functional forms and packages for that. Um, I'll discuss a bit later, like how to investigate packages. I may make that like a separate video. Um, but for just basic linear regression, you type LM. And on the left-hand side of the tilde sign, again, the tilde, um, I tend to view that as like um, as a function of, right, if I say like life spread as a function of GDP per capita means I'm taking life spread as the dependent variable and GDP as the independent variable. The other terminology that you use is like the the response variable and the explanatory variable. So life spread is response, GDP is explanatory. And then I can just run that, right? Again, I don't need the long notation because I've attached the data set. So I just use the variable name. And here's a odd thing about R is that when you run a linear regression, the only thing you get by default are the coefficients. And that's often really, typically we look for significance first before we even study the coefficients. So that's a bit odd. We will, I'll explain how to get around that in just a moment. We have um, on line 190, we have the linear model without an intercept. If you need to not have an intercept, you use minus one, and then we can just get a coefficient you know, by itself. I'm not sure that's probably not appropriate in this regression. Uh, and we can check other relationships, 193, 194. So we can see that um, fertility rate is has a negative relationship to the life expectancy gap, life expectancy gap. We um, fertility rate has a negative relationship to GDP per capita, higher income, less fertility. Um, life spread has a positive relationship to GDP per capita, so higher income means higher life spread. So we saw those basic relationships, but we need to know if they're significant. And to do that, we it's illustrated in line 198 we use a summary command. So summary command is very versatile. Here's another example of how it's used. Inside the parentheses is our regression. So it's a summary of the regression of LM, da da da. And when we run it in this form, we get a more normal type of regression table. We get the significance on each variable. And here we find that actually the, it's not significant 
um, at least in this naive form. Uh, obviously, when you're really doing analysis, you're going to consider lots of other ways to formulate the problem, transform the variables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have the significance level, the estimate, and the standard error. We have the R squared, which is you know explaining almost nothing, <laughs> um, and you know the other things that we typically look for. Um, let's see if any of those other ones are significant. So fertility rate is is significant um, at a 0 0.001 level, and it, it doesn't explain a lot of the variation, but much much more so than um, the the GDP and fertility versus GDP per capita. Um, also highly, highly significant with a, by the standards of this data set, a decent R squared. Okay, so we're just illustrating the basics of how this works. I don't want to read too much meaning into this data example. But if we want to, uh, we've just regressed against one variable. If we want to regress against multiple variables, very simple. Just add them with a plus. What have I done? I have cleaned my workspace. This, I accidentally hit this little broom, and the little broom just wipes out the contents of the console. So if this gets cluttered for you, you can clean it with the broom. Um, so where was I? So I was um, here. And these are all significant at the 0.001 level um, when I use them together. So fertility rate is explained by both per capita and the life spread in this example. All right, so a final um, power aspect of R is that um, a lot of stats programs will just give you this output. But R is, you know, it's a system for st statistical analysis, and it has these programming aspects. So we can store the data from a regression as an R object, and that's what happens in line 206. Instead of running the regression just in the console, we assign the regression to a named object that I'm going to call reg output, and now reg output exists in our environment, as you can see at the top right up here. And if I look at the names of reg output, that's the variable names, I have coefficients, I have residuals, I have fitted values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all been stored, and I can treat them just like any other R object. I can say, show me the residuals by saying reg output dollar sign residuals, the residuals variable in the reg output data. And here they are, the, the, just the list of residuals. Now, if you think about how you could use this is, you know, you could um, run multiple regressions, you know, 50 different versions of a model, store them as reg 1, reg 2, reg 3, and then start doing this subsequent analysis on specific things like, you know, the variation among the, the predicted values or, you know, there, there are really a lot of possibilities with that. Um, so this is an important feature that it's not just printing on the screen, it can be stored. Uh, we also have all these quick functions that are easier to use if you've stored your um, regression results. So you can say predict, uh, that quickly shows you the predicted values which you know then could be plotted into a, you know, piped into a plot. Uh, analysis of variance, so ANOVA. If we need that particular table, we have a quick way to generate that. Um, and we also can do things like backing away from regression for a second. We can do things like correlation. That's in line 219. Um, when we just run the the core command, we, we're asking for the correlation between two variables. 
This is another case where we have to um, remove the unused data. Um, so I want to say na.rm equals true, like we have been doing before. That also gets another error. This is yet another example of r being inconsistent, right? So the core command does not use na.rm equals true. It uses a different uh, thing called use complete observations. And once we specify that option, it'll now properly generate a correlation for us. Um, that's a case where you know you run something, you get an error, you go and look at the help, and you figure out how you need to modify it. This is a very typical in R. And 224 is uh, we can also do a correlation test to discover the significance of the correlation as well as the actual correlation value. So there's two ways to do it. One is just core, which gives you the simple correlation. The other one gives you core is core.test. And the final, absolute final thing for this part is we, we can plot our regression output so that we can easily diagnose whether the fit is good. This is built in. So we just say plot reg output. And it says down, down below, once we start that, it says hit return to see the next plot. So we do have to hit return. And then we'll start to see actually a sequence of four different plots that are typical things you'd look at to assess the fit of, of a model. So with the regression example, I tried to show you that you know, using the, the function names for statistical things are simple. The basic way to use them are simple, usually just specifying a couple of variables. But the other options, the power options, are there. Um, we can specify additional options. We can get the plots. We can store the results. Um, all that is, is available in R. So that's kind of a basic view of data analysis. Um, in the subsequent sessions, we're going to focus on plotting and data manipulation. Um, and other data analysis focused around specific techniques is not something that's I'm going to do in the 2020 series, but we do have some older videos on that, like survival analysis and time series analysis. So let me stop here. I'll say thank you for listening um, and good luck with exploring R.